audio and video or just audio? Uh, you're actually on a big screen here, mate. Oh, Jesus. Today on the High Performance Property Investment Podcast, I'm joined by a really great friend, both personally and in the industry, someone that we've really you know, had many conversations over the years that do offer unique insights into what is going on the heartbeat of property investment in Australia. It is Mike Mortlock from MCG Quantity Surveying, based up in Newcastle, but you know, uh, servicing the country, providing quantity surveying and depreciation schedules to property investors. I love your work, Mike. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. It's always good fun. We always uh, we always share some gold. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> uh, yes, I would agree with you. Um, it's Friday afternoon at the moment when we're so. Let's see where that takes us. <laughs> it's going to take you straight to the pub, by the sounds of it. <laughs> <laughs> I won't deny. It's all good. Um, but look, in serious, seriously. I have been watching your thousand asset studies very closely. Um, You have, uh, is it now you've released two of them? Well, we've actually, um, we've actually got seven years worth of data. Um, The first report came out in, in, uh, in 2020 and we've just done our second white paper. So yeah, you're right. So um, the first one was a five year study of investor trends and we've just released the, the seven year study of of investor behavior. So what, what I think is interesting about it, um, which is a bit biased because it's our bloody thing, but we look at 1,000 residential property investment transactions and we're comparing that year to year. We're getting a, a block of 1,000 residential transactions um, and we're just comparing all of the data points we have. So did they buy a house? Did they buy a unit? Did they renovate it? Did they live in it? If they renovated, how much did they spend? So all those data points that we collect through doing a depreciation schedule, we're able to see how they change over time. And hopefully it's interesting to someone that's not just me. Probably just to go back a step before we dive in, uh, I think you are in a unique position to do this study, right? So I, I've, I've often thought or described, you know, you as a coin surveyor, you know, you are engaged by a property investor, individual property investor to do a, a depreciation schedule. We can talk about what that is in a moment, but a property investor might come to you off the street. They might be recommended to you by a property manager, a sales agent, even a buyer's agent or other professionals in the industry. So you have exposure to you know, new house and land package sellers or established buyers agents or property investors or directly, you know, a a nice broad mix of the property investment heartbeat in the industry. And I think you're in a very unique position to actually do this. You know, here in Ripe House Advisory, we only focus on a very particular type of property investment. If we were to do this study, Michael, it would be very biased, right? So I think that you are in this unique position to do this study. And then you've looked at seven years worth of purchases across property investors. When we look at ABS, we know these property investors here, or we know these these properties are owned by investors, but we don't really know why or the makeup of them. We don't know, uh, you know, a lot of the specifics about that relationship or transaction. So I, I just probably want to go back a layer. You know, the data in these reports is unique, and I think it's very powerful for us to get that heartbeat of what's going on. Yeah, and and I think from the beginning when we started the business, the one one of the main things that we saw happening in our industry is is there is a lot of data out there, but our competitors were saying on average we get between five and ten thousand dollars worth of deductions, and I and I thought, well, firstly that's not an average, and secondly, what is the number? So we were the first company to come out with that figure as nine thousand one hundred eighty-two dollars, uh, and I remember that off the top of my head, and I think at the time I even gave two decimal places just to show we were paying attention. Um, but I, I'm very... there, Mike. sorry, mate. Yep. Um, just to clarify, what we're talking about there is a tax deduction. Is that correct? So you've exactly. bought a property, you've bought a property, and you're able to depreciate the building or the fixtures and fittings of that property over a number of years. So, just really simple terms if you've got a depreciation amount of a hundred thousand dollars over, say, 40 years you have a, a yearly depreciation of $2,500. That comes off your taxable income. So if you're earning $200,000 a year as your income, hey, well done. That's a lovely salary. That's excellent. Your taxable income is reduced by $2,500 by the very fact of owning that property. We're not talking about cash flow. We're not talking about the actual money in your pocket. This is the depreciation of the assets. You know, it's devaluing over time. 
that you can then decrease your taxable income from. So are you yes. saying, Mike, that over the last seven years of data, the average depreciation on each property per year or in the first year was, sorry, was 9,100 and... Um, so that, that was our that was our first data set where we came up that figure of nine thousand one hundred eighty two dollars. So um, that that figure changes every every day, right? Like we actually have a live TV uh, in our office that shows um, what the average deductions are each year. In the last one thousand asset sample, it was eight thousand nine hundred and nineteen actually rounded up 8920 so it normally sort of is somewhere between that sort of uh 85 to 95 sort of mark roughly but it just depends how, what sort of properties are in that sample i mean you can get a lot of older properties you can get a lot of newer properties um and that and that average deduction it doesn't i don't think it really tells us that much about what's happening in the industry i think if it's higher there's an argument to say well maybe people are buying more newer property or or more units but it could also just mean that certain locations are more more popular and the construction costs are higher there so that that's just kind of one metric but i think what's um even more interesting is things like you know renovation spends whether people live in their property prior to renting it out so these are all particular questions that we ask when we're doing a report and a lot of this data doesn't even exist like abs like you can't go to abs and say well on average people are spending x amount on on their renovation as soon as they buy an investment property or on average 20 percent of people live in their property before they turn it into an investment these are things that we can uncover i love it so let, let's unpack that a little bit more if we can so what's happened in the last couple of years so between your 2020 report and now we've obviously had COVID. Um, you've bought another Porsche. Uh, <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've had a building industry that's gone into turmoil. Material costs have gone through the roof. We've had interest rate rises. We've had a change of government. We've had Ukraine. Um, you know, we've had all of these things occurring. What are some of the trends that you've noticed in the second thousand assets report? Some of the big takeaways are the the prevalence of of purchasing purchasing new properties has dropped quite a bit. Um, so, for example, new property purchases, our data is showing that that was peaking at forty nine point six percent in two thousand and nineteen, and that's crashed back to sixteen point two four percent. So, wow. it, you know, I, I, it, it's just incredible the amount of new properties that was being purchased. And I remember when that data came out, I, I actually got a bit of hate mail. People were sort of saying, you know, why are you encouraging people to buy new properties as investments? I'm like, I'm not. I'm just doing the depreciation schedules. I can only do what people bring to me, right? And, it, and, and if there's anyone that I need to help, it's probably a lot of these people that are buying these new apartments because we saw massive oversupplies in in places like Melbourne and Brisbane and you know parts of Western Sydney as well. Um, so so that's a that's a big um, takeaway. Um, one thing that we've also noticed is that houses are representing 60% of purchases as, as distinct from say units and townhouses that's up 18% in 12 months and units are down 35% in 12 months. So units uh, are definitely not the flavor of the month at the moment. So, I mean, in the world of private advisory, you know, ripe house advisory, the research and things that we do, it's, you know, we, we look at what performs the strongest as an investor. You know, when you're, I guess, as a property investor, you're educating yourself, you're empowering yourself, you might be working with a professional. Um, you know, you're going to a property investment expert for property investment advice. Generally, that results in buying an established dwelling that's a house. Yep. And traditionally, that's where we've seen the strongest capital growth results over time, buying in a very scarce established area. And you want the land component because land appreciates and then you depreciate the asset, the house, yeah, but you yeah. want that land component. So generally lower density houses, that's the strongest capital growth results we see over time. So do you think this might be a move towards houses and established dwellings because people are learning, you know, the property investment community is empowering themselves and, and, you know, I guess, um, you know, seeing the light or seeing the, the, the good side of the industry, or this is just a factor of limited supply uh, and COVID means units are not the flavor of the month. 
Yeah, look, I would love it to be the first point, right? I'd love it to be the case that the education is such that investors aren't buying low quality investment stock anymore. I'm not necessarily sure that that is is the case. While I think the, the education is improving and there's a lot of good people out there giving some great advice, you know, there's some good books, there's some good podcasts, there's good, some good thought leaders that are just sort of saying, you know, talking about things like land to asset ratio and and talking about, you know, some of the pitfalls of buying these brand new properties. But I think people have kind of figured out that these one bedroom apartments, they're, they're, they're just not they're just not capital growth machines like machines it's 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 the glossy brochure you know anytime that that someone is selling something and they're using depreciation as a selling point like even though i'm a depreciation guy i would sort of say that that's a bit of a red flag yeah like you you don't want to be investing in any asset class to save tax it's not a reason to invest so you invest things for return and i think that's uh you know a Another way I've heard it expressed in the past is when you're buying an, a new dwelling, you are part of the problem. You know, in any market, I go back to that's <laughs> in any market. Um, I always go back to the 1600s when you had the tulip craze where tulip prices went up, you know, hundreds of percentage points. Yeah. It's because the demand was outstripping the supply and it created this asset bubble. I'm not saying property is an asset bubble. But, you know, these any any market, whether it's tulips or property, it moves based on demand and supply. That's it's human behavior. Um, so when you are in a, you know, a supply, you know, a high supply type asset, like new homes or unit blocks, you're part of the problem. You know, it's a wonderful way of looking at it. Um, if you want further information on this as well, guys, like we spent three months in a study on this uh and we developed, we released some research about 18 months ago on this in the YouTube channel. So it's new versus home, a uh, new versus old. It's about a 45 minute deep dive on this. And look at a really high level, it's very difficult to calculate the capital growth results for new homes because there's no actual sale to track the starting price from because mm. it's generally sold as land and then a build and the build is not public knowledge, right? So it's very hard to measure the capital growth for these properties. So we can't say what if it's better or worse, but we did. Um, we actually found over 1,200 or 1,100 properties in Queensland that had sold twice fi- within the five years after they'd been built. So they've sold twice on the open market and we could measure the capital growth then for those 1,000 or so properties. That's enough sample size for us. And it was actually lower capital growth than inflation. And that's not 7 or 8% inflation like it is now. That's under 2% inflation. So they basically were going backwards yeah. And, you know, this is, it's confirming what we know, you know, you're part of the problem. The supply is the problem. And when you're going into these new, no one's going to pay more for your assets. If it, if they can go down the road and build something, you know, on a vacant lot with a nice shiny new kitchen, yours yeah. is a secondhand property. The moment it's finished. So it makes sense. And unfortunately, a big part of our industry is, you know, the spruker, the house and land seller, the marketing companies that sell this, I'm not going on a, on a bit of a rant here. I did have a point I was making, Mike, is <laughs> hopefully people are seeing through this. Um, I fear that it's not, though. I would probably take the other perspective, Mike, and I'll just say I talk to house and land package marketers. I talk to them. I get to yeah, know them. Yeah. I get to know the enemy. I get to know the dark side of the industry with a lack of a better word, and they just can't access builders. You know, they might be, you know, it's not like they're not trying to sell the products that they can sell. It's, it's the problem for them is that they can't access the builders to build them. Yeah. Um, and that's why, that's the only reason why I feel that the data is showing what you're saying it, it's showing at yeah. the moment, Mike. So hopefully, you know, hopefully people see that there is a better way. Um, hopefully over the last sort of 12 months, people have moved into established dwellings because people want to invest regardless. And then they realize, holy cow, these results I've generated from this, maybe it's got to do with this as an established dwelling. And they maybe don't listen to their accountant who's giving them the tax advice to save tax, which is not investment advice. It's Hmm. a tax minimization strategy. And then they, you know, might be referring them to the off the plan seller. You know, hopefully that doesn't happen. So Hmm. we hold out hope. Do you think so? Yeah, you, I mean, I always hold out hope. And it's part of the reason why I started my podcast, you know, four and a half years ago, when I 
I thought this is a bit sad. All all the podcasts that exist have have already been launched, right? And now I look like an early adopter four and a half years ago. <laughs> um, but the whole motivation was that you know the stats were then that seventy two percent of people only own one property, and I don't think that's necessarily enough to change their financial future. And I think the reason why, and you know now that the stats are still 68% is because they're getting that first investment property wrong and that might be costing them money or they might end up having to sell it. And it just kind of makes them sort of think, well, this, you know, the property investing kind of isn't for me. There's, there's, there's so much poor advice out there and, and, and talking about, you know, tax minimization as a strategy before, you know, an buying an asset that's going to go up in value. It's just, it's just crazy to me. Yeah, it's um. Look, I, I can understand it though. Like I, I, I talk to investors a, a lot about this, and probably something that I hear a lot is they want to have a nice, glossy new investment property. It's a status yeah. symbol in some ways. They've got a property in this new subdivision or new precinct, and they like the idea that it is new and low maintenance. And you probably see this on the coal face as well. Yeah. Um, you know, there are strategies that you can employ in established dwellings, coming in and doing cosmetic renos, you know, improving those items that are, you know, risky in terms of maintenance. If it has got a tired bathroom that might be starting to leak, uh, you know, having some waterproofing issues, etc. Well, then coming in and doing that reno and guess what? If it costs you twenty or 30000 to do that bathroom reno, well, can you depreciate that, Mike? And can you depreciate established assets in the same way that you can new homes? Yeah, I mean, there's there's been some changes to the legislation, um, and they're old now, like 2017, where the um, the then treasurer, now ex prime minister Scott Morrison, uh, basically said that if you are buying a, a property to claim the plant and equipment components like the carpets, blinds, kitchen appliances, um, you either have to buy a brand new property or you need to install a brand new asset in. So it, it, it unleveled the playing field. New properties are better for depreciation than, than older, um, you know, everything being equal. But older properties, if you're renovating and you're putting those new assets in, you can still claim them. So if you're putting in a kitchen and bathroom, you can claim them. And, and some quantity surveyors will say, you know, new property is always better than old property for depreciation. But, you know, a $350,000 build project home compared to say a property that's had a half million dollar renovation, the renovation is probably going to be better in deductions than the brand new project home, right? So it's not always the case, but yes, yeah, certainly with these older properties, you can claim those deductions. And getting back to that status point, I mean, if status is your real motivation and it's hard for me to get in that mindset, but like, wouldn't it be better off for your status to, to actually buy a property that's going to go up in value and make you more money so that you can flash that around in a statusy way? Like, you know, a shiny property <laughs> or say a property that, you know, grows by 50 or a hundred grand a year. And then, I don't know, go and buy a Ferrari and drive it around in circles or, uh, around your enemies. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, that, that does sound like a very logical way of, thinking about it I, I i'm i it's it's been multiple occasions i've had conversations and it's generally someone's partner i'm having a conversation with an aspirational investor and it's their partner who is saying no i really want something that is new and glossy and shiny and smells new but the moment that they purchase it it's now not new anymore yeah. Yeah. you know they have a tenant in there for six months or it's vacant for three months because there's an oversupply in the area mm. and then the house over the road finishes three weeks later guess what that's the newest property in the area so you see this um it, it's it's you, you sort of kind of catch the tail a little bit of it and it's it's a bit of a scary sort of idea um but that's really society isn't it mike you know people get a credit card to go and buy a louis vuitton handbag <laughs> well, it's what? like that's Lewis, status, Lewis it? Vitton, as I like to call him. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really, really stupid. And, and I think the world is going a little bit more like that. This is getting real deep here. We probably have to start the drinks um, already. Um, it's the way of the world. I mean, you look at Instagram, like no one puts on Instagram, you know, a typical worst day that they have every six, six months. You know, I put a picture of a, a, a pair of my shoes that I really liked with duct tape wrapped around them. Cause I'd blown the side out. Right. Cause that's what I want Instagram to be. I want it to be real. You know, like this is my real life. These are my, 
these are my sixty dollars shoes that I bought from a from an outlet in Hawaii, and I bought two of them just because I like them. I knew they'd blow out, and I'm down to my last pair, but I don't want to throw it away because they're still good, and a bit of duct tape fixes it. But you just don't get that on Instagram. Right. There's nothing a bit of duct tape can't fix. That's very exactly. good. Exactly. But I mean, in, in that example where they're saying, like, I want a new property, I think when they say that, they cease to become an investor, right? Like, that's not a that's not an investment decision. It's not a business decision. Like, uh, there's a, there's a, a, a chappy um, in the property space. I won't mention his name, but he, he's, he said to me once, look, if, if buying kebabs got me the outcome that I wanted, I'd be in the kebab business, but it's just property, right? So property is kind of like the afterthought, like it's just the vehicle, right? And and you, there's, there shouldn't be any emotional attachment to the property itself. It's like, what does this property do? Does it move the needle of what I want to achieve, you know, closer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, because we live in properties and because Australian, you know, it's almost Australia's national pastime, we all have a very active interest in property. We then, you know, project that onto property investment. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess a lot of that's going on as well. But um, for me, it needs to be an outcome-based approach. You know, we need to look at where we are now, where we want to get to, what do we need to plug into this gap? And yeah. then we need to go off and look for the outcome. And we need to do it without any of these blinkers on, uh, you know, and to be perfectly frank with you, um, you know, the average commission on a so you've got a new home and and someone's offered that new home to you they might be receiving thirty thousand dollars commission yeah you know on that property so that's an extreme amount of money uh for one sale so you have to think well who's that attracting to sell that to me it's not attracting a, a junior salesperson who's just you know they've been you know doing uh solar panels or have just entered the industry these are the the, the top caliber salespeople globally you know this is a really high ticket sale and ticket item some of the some of the strategies they might use your in-home sales you know these are highly advanced psychological sales strategies that are highly refined um these are the guys that are now packaging this up into something that is just to you know just, you know in a very digestible um, non-confrontational way because mm. of the commissions involved in this and that's what you know that's that's what we see in the industry i guess and um Anyway, there is there is other ways, and and for me, even if you're doing this yourself, um, there's always exceptions to the rule, Mike. You know, there's there's new homes that I've seen that generate wonderful returns, but it is a it's a minefield, and these established dwellings that are absolute duds. That's okay, um, but we're talking about the exception and not the rule here. Let's not fight against the grain. Let's go and swim with the currents. Um, mm. you know, that's how I would look at it. Let's sort of set ourselves up for success and not try and outthink ourselves and really we have to question everything that is told to us in the industry because of the stakes involved and because of the commissions being paid this is high stake material anyway i'm i'm ranting a little bit mike i did want to talk about depreciation <laughs> did um, you? If come on okay. tell, the truth. tell the truth yeah it's, it's something i literally wake up most mornings and go today i need to talk about depreciation <laughs> with someone usually it's not a depreciation expert it's just someone random i bumped into and uh, okay so <laughs> depreciation <laughs> yeah. most, a lot of people don't actually have a depreciation schedule on their investment properties mm. so i'm just going to break this down really simply and then you can sort of fill in the gaps for me if that's okay mike sure. a depreciation schedule is a document that you can then use in preparing your tax to depreciate your asset so you're then getting money back off your taxable income each year without a depreciation schedule you cannot do that right so a depreciation schedule might lower your taxable income on the property that you already own by five, ten thousand more per year. So if you don't have that depreciation schedule, you're really losing out on that for the time that you don't have it. Um, is that correct, or am yep. I missing the point here? No, that's good. I could get you a job in sales. Um, let, let me let me paint another picture. Right, um, we did a, a study a couple of years ago where we looked at again a thousand transactions a thousand is the thing we do we're just we're stuck on it now um and we found that 6.7 percent of people actually waited so long to get in touch with us that they would have missed out on deductions so you can actually back claim two financial years so if you bought a house 
a couple of years ago, you could go to your account and say, I forgot to tell you I bought this property. Can we amend my previous tax return for these deductions? And here's a depreciation schedule. You can do that. It'll, it'll cost you a fee, but most of the time it's worth it. So 6.7% mm. of people waited so long that even the two years wasn't enough. They bought it three years ago, four years ago, or even in one case, 16 years ago, a lady bought a unit off the plan and she waited 16 years to get in touch with us and missed about $64,000 worth of deductions. But the average figure of missed deductions of those 6.7% was $20,537. So that could be seven or $8,000 gone from their pocket. And what we did, because we love... Um, now, before you go on there, so yeah, yeah. that's $20,000, then you've got 30 cents in the dollar in tax. Yeah. So yeah. you're decreasing your taxable income by 20 grand, and then you're saving $7,000 in tax at the 30 cent tax rate. That's sort of... yeah. That's the number. So, that, so you don't get the twenty grand as a check. You get the taxable income reduced by twenty thousand. Therefore, you're saving. You get more in your tax return. You're saving. Yeah, yeah. It could be seven or eight, nine thousand if you're on the high marginal rate. So, but but that is the figure gone from people's pocket, uh, and and I think that's pretty significant, right? And 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 if you think about that data. That 6.7% of people might not sound like a lot, but that's the people that eventually figured out that they need a quantity surveyor. There are so many people out there that have never even heard of a quantity surveyor, mm. don't know about tax depreciation. And even that 6.7% figure, because we've got a, a journalist that helps us with PR and everyone loves clickbait, if you extrapolate that 6.7% across the investor population, we worked out that it's $2.88 billion worth of deductions that are out there unclaimed by property investors. So you have a tremendous duty there to talk about this. <laughs> Okay. I, well, I think so. Like, my, I, I feel motivated to stop buy Australia buying dodgy submarines. Like, that's the number one thing. Like, cause, you know, people sort of say, oh, you know, it's my duty to pay ta tax and I should help out. And I'm like, well, yeah, like, that's fine. But don't pay more than you need to. This is not a loophole. You know, like people yeah. talk about, you know, negative gearing being a loophole. You know, I think it came in in 1936 or thereabouts. So it's not a loophole. It's an established thing. You're in, you're entitled to reduce your tax and if you want to give it away give it away to a charity don't give it to a to a, to the australian government so that they can buy some some submarines not from the french okay well for any other reason um i guess this is a sort of i i didn't really intend for this to be the direction of our conversation but i have recently been seeing a lot of marketing messages you know i am in the industry uh for you know people talking about uh how you can in the next seven years reduce your taxable income to zero by buying property investments and that's i think probably what they're trying to get at there with their marketing messages is come to us we'll buy you five properties um and then each of those is going to deduct your taxable income by 10 or 15 grand um uh, and then, therefore, you're going to have a zero taxable income. You're not going to pay any tax. Yeah. Um, I mean, that in theory works, doesn't it? But you, I, I guess these people are probably trying to sell house and land packages. That can still work to with established dwellings as well. Yeah. Um, what sort of established dwellings have you seen generate the strongest uh, deductions? The the, the strong. I mean, when you think about the deductions, a lot of the or time. Yeah, the, the, a lot of the time it's the the expensive places that will give you the best deductions. But we we've also had someone bring us an eight million dollar place in Sydney that we actually said there are no deductions in this property. Um, so just because you're spending a heap of money on the property doesn't guarantee deductions. But normally, if it's if it's an older heritage style property in one of those blue chip locations, some of these places have had a million dollar renovations, right? You know, so so we're talking twenty five grand a year year just in structural deductions which is pretty epic but if you're wow. comparing things side by side the units do tend to provide better deductions because they you have an entitlement over the common areas the construction cost per square meter is higher because it's a you know it's a more complex thing to build um, and if okay. we're talking about say a house newer properties are better for depreciation most of the time unless it's a property that's had you know significant renovations but the cutoff date for depreciation claims 
times on the original building structure is 1987. So you can still have properties built in the 90s and the noughties that will have great deductions for you. So this whole idea of let's go out and buy these properties and with the sole purpose of decreasing our taxable income to zero, and then guess what? We've got this nice shiny new home here and buy three or four of those you can do the same thing with established. You know, you might yeah. be able to go down the road and buy a good, strong, high performance growth property in a good scarce location without any new land releases and things around and still execute the same tax minimization strategy. So that is, same pitch, yeah. I guess, applies. It, it is possible. Um, I, like it's, mm. it's the wrong strategy, in my opinion, to just go, all right, what's your number one goal? My number one goal is to pay no tax. But Taxes, taxes. Well, it's all I've got to be perfectly frank, Mike, because I know the, the properties are generally not growing in value. So they've got to try and go back into that little black box and work out yeah. one way of selling this shitty stock. This, yeah, exactly. This- I mean, and that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? Like ta- tax, tax is kind of like, you know, it's a commission on your success, right? So in some respects, the more tax that you're paying, the better off you're doing. Like I think sometimes we're a bit too negative with tax. Like people are going, oh, you know, I'm going to try and avoid capital gains tax. I'm like, well, well done on making a capital gain. You know, you actually made money. There, there are obviously legitimate ways to minimize your tax, but just just going into investing to, to with a strategy of minimizing your tax is wrong. You know, like people, I've heard accountants say that people come to them and say, you know, I need to buy an investment property. And they're like, why? I'm like, well, I'm paying too much tax. It begs the question, well, do you care if it's like a good investment property? Do you care if it goes up in value? No, like just, I just don't want to pay tax. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. people fear that stick more than the, you know, the stick of tax versus the carrot of capital growth. Yeah, it's a good point. And I, I think we could, it, it's it's something that I think we're both very aware of. And um, it's a big part of, of what motivates me, I guess, to, 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 to work with investors or to keep having these types of conversations. So I think it, yeah. it's, 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 it's about empowering ourselves with knowledge. Um, and this is a conversation I think has done that, Mike. I, I really do. So for those of you, it's not too late. If you haven't got a depreciation schedule already in your properties, you potentially still can. And then still go back and redo your taxes and get money back in your return. If you uh, had just buying a property, then you may as well get a depreciation schedule from the moment that you do have it. So for the next tax return, it's ready to go. Um, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong here, MCG Quantity Surveyors, if you go along to you and you might be able to tell us the, the cost for a depreciation schedule in a moment, you might have a client that brings a property to you and says, look, can you do a depreciation schedule on that? And there's just nothing claimable on it. So if that's the case, if they can't claim, you know, uh, if they can't claim anything against that property, do you still charge these people? No, no. Like I, I sometimes I, I sort of say to people, look, at the end of the day, I want to be able to look myself in the mirror and not be any more annoyed than this face. Right. And this cheap haircut, you know, that already that's enough. That's upsetting. Um, but to charge people money for something that they're not getting value out of, like that's not the sort of business that I want to own. So normally the first step in organizing a depreciation schedule is we have a look at the property online. So if you give us the real estate.com listing or whatever it is, and we can see pretty quickly you know, past um, sales photos, past listing photos um, for rental. So we can get a fairly good idea about whether it's worthwhile or not. Um, So if we don't see any value in getting the report done, i.e. the report really got to pay for itself in the first year, then we would just say, look, this one doesn't stack for whatever reason. We'd love to help you with the next one. Perfect. Um, Is it okay if we talk about the cost of these reports? Yeah, sure. So, most most full service quantity surveyors uh, are charging six to seven hundred dollars plus GST for a report. Our standard fee is six fifty plus GST, but we look after all of your clients for six plus GST, um, and of course um, that's tax deductible. So that that sort of factors into the calcs. But if if we can't be getting at least double our fee worth of deductions in the first year, we're not going to go ahead with that. Um, often it might be a, a borderline case where we say, all right, well, go and chat to your account and say, is it worth me paying X to get Y? And let them be the decider of whether it's beneficial. Because sometimes the accountant will say, oh, yeah, because you've got a year back claim or I know that you're going to rent it out for the next two years. So, yeah, you're in the clear. Um, so so we want to we work with accountants all the time in those situations just to make sure that it stacks i love it 
So it's just worth having a conversation. We'll put a link here in the show notes for you to go into MCG Coin Surveying. Um, even flicking through addresses to you directly, you say yay or nay. If it's a yay, then you spend money to make more money back in your taxes. Well, yeah, I think that's a, a pretty good idea. So I love your work, Mike. It's always an absolute pleasure. Um, how can we best get in contact with you outside of MCG? Is there any, you know, uh, I know you're always active in the podcast world, but then also other socials that you'd like us to, to, to check out? Yeah, Ge Geared for Growth is the podcast. So you've been a, a, an esteemed guest a number of times on that. Um, so you can check that out. That's on yep. uh, Spotify and all That's that sort of stuff. Growth. Sorry, guys. Geared for Growth. Geared for Growth. Yep. yep. Yeah, I'm Facebook, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, I mean, if, if you're interested in tape shoes, follow me on Instagram, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. I'll share, you know, our data and, and, and tax tips and investor insights fairly regularly. I love your work, Mike. It's, it's always an absolute pleasure. I, I think your heart's in the right place. Um, and, you know, the advice that you give is really there to, to help people. I think that's that comes across first and foremost. So thank you coming on today and, and helping our audience understand what you do and, and tax depreciation and how it can benefit us. It's always a pleasure and the, the feeling's mutual as well. Love your work.